right, everyone. Good morning and welcome to another episode of the True Safety Podcast. And offline, I have already told Ed how excited I am and honored I am to have such a special guest with us today. Ed Folk is the president at Fisher and uh, and Phillips Safety Solutions. He is an attorney and he's a former sec- assistant secretary at the U.S. Department of Labor, so OSHA. And I'm just so excited to, to dive right in and explore your mind. And I have a million questions, Ed, but first of all, thank you so much for being with us this morning. My pleasure. I'm looking forward to uh, talking a little bit about safety and uh, where it's going and everything else. So. Absolutely. I mean, I'll just jump right in. My first burning question is what was it like working with OSHA? I mean, that was, <laughs> I saw, oh my gosh, that could, that could be an hour long conversation, but just what was that like? Yeah, it could be. That's true. So, <laughs> well, I, I enjoyed it. I had the opportunity. It, I was, uh, it was interesting. I, I wasn't expecting to, um, you know, it kind of, the White House kind of came out of the blue and called me up and asked me if I'd be willing to be considered for the position. I'd actually at the time been trying to get one of my clients to, to take the job, but he was smart enough not to do it. So, <laughs> so there you were. <laughs> and there I was. So, um, and I knew there were at least five other people that were asking, that were trying to get the actively trying to get the job. So I was really kind of surprised. So, and being the kind of the first lawyer that was ever confirmed as assistant secretary of labor for OSHA, uh, that was kind of an interesting difference. I mean, I was different, but I have a fairly detailed safety background also. And uh, I've been doing this for a long time. And uh, uh, I started, um, people asked me, how did I start in safety and health? And I told it was by accident, but uh, really it was by a fatality. Unfortunately, it was, uh, it was back in 1980. So that just shows you how old I am. Uh, I was out of law school two years and um, and uh, I graduated from law school when I was eight, just so you know that. That's when just for the record. Uh, we'll yeah, just for it. the record there. Anyway, uh, and a client of mine, uh, it was a construction company. You mentioned about construction. Uh, and um, they had a, um, a guy was standing halfway up a six-foot ladder, and he fell backwards. So he's standing three feet off the ground, fell backwards, and got killed. Unbelievable. And that was a very learning lesson. So, But it was really interesting to be with OSHA. Um, uh, it's a challenging job. There's no doubt about it. Um, they have some really good people. They have long-term career people there uh, who really care about safety and health. And that's that was the thing. And that was one of the things I was trying to deal with too while I was there is the succession planning because I could see that um, in the years coming, in the, in the not too distant future, there was going to be a lot of people retiring from OSHA because they've been there almost from the beginning uh, when, the, uh, when the OSHA started, which would have been 1970-71. Mm-hmm. And um, they, uh, so they, it was working, working with a lot of career people who had a lot of experience, were very dedicated. That was very good. Um, the interesting thing, uh, probably for me, one of the more difficult things was I, I did a lot of testifying on the Hill. Okay. Uh, during the three years that I was, I was there the last three years of the Bush, the George W. Bush administration. And, um, at the time, there was uh, the Democrats controlled both the House and Senate. The last two years, I should say, the last two years of that. So I was up there. I may have been I may have been testifying on the Hill more than anybody else in the administration because I was up there a, a lot. And uh, wow. and then I was also during that time period, I was interviewed by sixty Minutes um, on, the, uh, yep. on the combustible dust. Uh, so it, it was, it was a real learning experience. Uh, I, I like to think I did a lot for the agency. I still get a lot of, uh, I deal with a lot of people since I'm still practicing OSHA law. Uh, I deal with a lot of the OSHA people that I dealt with back then. Uh, but there's been a lot, like I say, that have retired. A lot of the senior people that, uh, in senior leadership positions have retired, but, uh, you know, I knew a lot of the young people, too, that were coming up. And so uh, it's always nice to talk to them. And, uh, and they, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of traveling with a lot of the offices and they I come up you know, work with some of the area directors now that were back then were just at compliance ins- inspectors. And they say, yeah, we came. I remember when you came by to pick me up. I had one guy told me, I said, you know, you don't probably remember this. I picked you up at the airport. <laughs> so, I said, well, I don't really do. But that's uh, but it, like I said, it's a good group of people. 
uh, and they're very dedicated. And I enjoyed doing the work. And I think we made a lot of progress, you know, particularly on the compliance assistance areas, partnerships, alliances. Um, I mean, enforcement was still obviously a, a key component of what we were doing. But, um, you know, I, I, I had the belief that, you know, enforcement will not get uh, get us you know, companies in the United States to get the United States to zero injuries, illness, and fatalities in the workplace. So I think compliance assistance is more likely to kind of help get that way. You have enforcement, but I think you got to get people to want to have great safety. So mm-hmm. and explain why it's important. I want to hold on to that thought and go back to it because um, going back to going back to the first Uh, thing you mentioned there is the fatality going even back to your career before OSHA and how you got into safety. You mentioned that it was by accident and that you had recently graduated their law school. Then you worked, one of your clients was a construction company. You worked on a fatality. And can you just share with the audience what that experience was like for you? Was that a large company, small um, it was a large company. It, it, it morphed into one of the largest construction engineering companies in the country or in the world, actually. And um, they were headquarters in Greenville, South Carolina at the time. And um, but, yeah, it was, you know, like I say, what, what that showed me was that people die very easily. Mm-hmm. This person falling backward three feet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I've actually had two cases where people have been standing halfway up six foot ladders and fallen off of them and got killed Mm -hmm. so people that's why it's i think safety is so important i mean uh, it's very it's um the way how easy things happen you got to be careful that's why safety is so important i've done over 400 osha fatality investigations so i've seen a lot of them and uh, it's never very pleasant and it's a it really takes a toll on companies a lot of companies don't recognize a lot of people don't think about this but yeah you have a um when you have a fatality, particularly for a small, medium-sized company or facility where the employees all know each other, and if they have a fatality, it's going to dramatically impact them. It's going to impact them from a, a, a production standpoint. It's going to, and, and from a profitability and all that uh, standpoint, but it's also going to have a tremendous impact on the employees. And, uh, and once again, that's why it's so important to make sure that we have great safety in place. And, uh, you know, uh, and the United States is doing well, but uh, you know we've kind of plateaued off now, and mm-hmm. on our injury and in injury and illness and fatality rates. It's as a matter of fact, the fatality rates kind of uh, have gone up in the in the recent past, and so that's a little concerning. I mean, and so the question becomes: How can we, uh, how can we keep doing this? What do we need to do to make it and safe even more important, more focused? In yeah, what is that? Is? Why why have we flatlined? Why why is that happening right now? Where we've even well flatlined, but fatalities have even risen just to, um, more than the last couple of years. And so, what is your opinion on that? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. Even during the pandemic, I mean, I've talked to a number of area offices and asked. I, I always talk when I'm talking to them. I say, "How's your fatality rates going and stuff for this year?" And even during the uh, pandemic, there was, was probably, which you would thought, okay, there's not that much work going on, but uh, there was. And, uh, and unfortunately, the numbers actually, I'll be interested to see when the new numbers come out. Why it's happening, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think to a certain degree, we've come a long way and we've, our numbers have really driven down dramatically. Mm-hmm. Over, If you look since 1970, particularly if you look all the way back when the post was first started, when the act was first passed. Yeah. Um, it was um, a very, um, the numbers have really dropped dramatically, but they come on, they just kind of plateaued and everything is a blip and it goes up. And uh, um, I think to a certain degree, complacency, you know, one of the things that, and, and the safety profession, I, you know, I tell the people that when I talk to safety groups, I tell them, I say, you know, we got, you know, we got to do better. We have to do other additional things than, than what we've been doing over the years. And, uh, and safety and health, Unfortunately, in the past, has not really occupied uh, the the view the the preview of the of the C suite, the CEO, CFOs, presidents, companies, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Safety was always kind of a sideline in a way, and uh, 
one if one if one good thing has come out of the pandemic, a lot of bad things have come out of the pandemic. But if one good thing has been is that now safety and health is much more visible, has become more visible to the C-suite than it has ever before. And um, you know that's one thing I've always preached about. I think for a long time is that the safety profession has to get in the suites C-suite. If you look at our profession. Um, there are not very many VPs of safety in companies. Uh, there were, but there are VPs of HR, right, uh, and right. VPs of environmental stuff like that. But we've not done a really good job, and uh, we as a profession, and we missed the boat on several cases. You know, particularly like uh, on sustainability. That's the big watchword in corporate America today, and. Uh, that sustainability really was driven by uh, the environmentalist. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is kind of seen as a green, green thing, but it really shouldn't be. I mean, it's like you know, the focus of sustainability is has always it's been and it's been what do you put in the air, what do you put in the water, and what do you put in the ground. But my thought is, well, if you don't care about the safety of your employees, right. why would you care what you put in the air, what you put in the ground, what you put in the water? That's a great point. Uh, it's, it's pretty, yeah. you know, this, uh, sustainability, uh, the, the, the bedrock of safe sustainability should have always been employee safety. Perfect. That's where it should have worked. But unfortunately, the environmentalist group, whatever the ones that are out there really pushing this and the safety profession never got into it. Now it's starting to change a little bit. You're starting to see more of that. Uh, and um, and that's going to be a good thing. But and, and like I say, because of the pandemic, now the C, C-suite looks at safety a department at, in their companies as helping them make sure that the companies keep operating and and do actually contribute to the bottom line. And that's the part of the problem with a lot of safety professions. They don't really know how to talk the C-suite language, how to talk about return on investment, how to being able to know about pennies per share on stocks and second, how safety can improve stock prices penny per square. Here's the based on return on investment. And that's kind of I'm seeing more of that with the safety profession moving in that direction, but uh, we still got a long way to go. I couldn't agree more that there is difficulty around the conversation with safety professionals when they're trying to communicate to their, their direct reports. They're trying to communicate to the leadership team the value of what they're trying to implement. And if it's new training, if it's a new program, um, whatever the initiative might be, there's, there's pushback, right? Like anything, but there's, I, we get that question asked often is how Yeah, you have to sell it. You, you, uh, the safety profession has to be able to sell why they're doing it. And that's when I talk about return on investment and because this, you know, the safety, the, the people in the C-suite, um, you know, a lot of them have MBAs. And there's not one MBA program in the country that has a course in the MBA program dealing with safety. Right. So how can you expect your CEO, CFOs, president, whatever, COO, uh, to understand about safety? Well, because they haven't been trained in it. Right. And, um, and so we have to, as safety professionals, need to be able to articulate and speak in their language. we got to be able to talk about risk. They understand risk. You talk about risk, you talk about return on investment, you talk about pennies per share, how it impacts penny per share. These programs may in, on, a, on a publicly traded company. They mm-hmm. understand that very clearly. And uh, that's how the safety profession has to be has to be more focused on. And part of the problem, to be quite honest, you know, we as a profession for a long, 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 long time, have looked at lagging indicators and have used lagging indicators as our metrics. Right. Start rates, injury and illness rates, all those things. And we have been showing our company, and, and because the safety people do get in front of the C-suite at least once a year to talk about where what's going on in this, what's going on. And all the time, what was the presentation? Here's our chart on our dart rate. Here's our chart on our lost time injury and illness rate. You know, and look how it's going down. So yeah, we've, sure. and look at these safety manuals we have. We got lots of big safety manuals and all this training we do. Yeah. So we've trained the C-suite to think, well, God, we got a great safety program here. Because look at those numbers, they're all going down. Mm-hmm. But you can have a crappy safety program and still get to zero injuries, illnesses, and fatalities for at uh-huh. least a year. It's not sustainable, but you can get there. 
And uh, so what does that do for us? It doesn't do us, it, it, and that's what I'm thinking. And, and that's one good thing that I've seen over the last, I don't know, five, seven years that, that we've moved to a more, um, um, uh, uh, more leading indicators as opposed to lagging indicators. And that's part of what's going to be seeing. And I, you know, and I think uh, the more we do that, is the more likely we're going to see a lot more people. We're going to see the numbers start to get down. And also, we're going to be able to, we got to communicate those type of things. But really, the, the safety profession needs more and more to be understanding what the C-suite language is. How do we talk about risk? Because everything, all businesses uh, focus on risk. And uh, where's the... At, Pardon me? Oh, no, go no, ahead. I mean, if they're going to move, if they're going to put a new plan in, what's the risk of putting a new plan in somewhere? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or, or whatever. They're going to start a new marketing program. What's the risk on that? They, they look at all these types. If we're going to merge with somebody, what's the risk? And safety and health needs to be talking about risk they, because, because the C-suite does understand risk. And then, like I say, we have to be able to articulate. If we're going to be asking, we need to, if we're going to be saying, we need this new program, we need, we, we're going to institute this program, we want to put in this, um, we want to, uh, we need this money for adding new, uh, new type of safety equipment. Mm -hmm. Until we're able to articulate what the return on investment is going to be, uh, we're not going to be successful. And so, uh, and that's part of the problem we've had over the years. We've just not been able to articulate that. And so the C suite thinks we have, they have a great safety program, so they don't have to worry about it. And at the same time, they don't need to, they don't want to spend any money because you're not articulating why this is going to, why this is going to be helpful from a company profitability standpoint. Absolutely. And how, um, what would be some first steps on maybe some examples, some first steps, how can safety professionals, if they're listening in today, what are some leading indicators that they can share with their leadership team? to help gain more traction with the safety program, to get more buy-in? What are some leading indicators um, that might be helpful to start that conversation? Well, the, the leading indicators are, are way more ways to try to tell how, how good a safety program we actually really have. So, I mean, we still look at the lagging indicators. We got to see where we've been, how we're we doing. If we see something going wrong, then we got to say what's going wrong. Mm -hmm. But the leading indicators like, you know, preventive maintenance, how much, how often are we doing preventive maintenance? Do we have a safety committee? Uh, how how frequently do they meet? How do they? Um, uh, what what are their recommendations? How quickly do their recommendations be implemented? How many you know checking all those type of things? How many safety observations are we doing? How, you know, are our supervisors doing? How many safety observations are our employees doing? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the working on trying to improve. And, and what are the near miss? What, what are dealing with how how are we looking at near misses and stuff like that? Trying to identify near misses. Uh, because all those kind of work that way into uh, improving the overall safety. And then on, ta on talking about um, on how you sell your programs, why we're putting this in place, you got to be able to figure out and you, and you need to know, okay, what is, if we implement this program, what's it going to do? Well, how's it going to, it's going to cost X. Okay. We know it's going to cost X. So what is the benefit to it? And, um, and, and, and how is that going to save our company money? How's it going to improve productivity? How's it going to improve quality? How does it have an impact on the environment? Maybe, maybe not. And those are the type of things that they need to know and, and to be able to articulate that and be able to explain that. And then the other thing is you need to be, you need to know what metrics your bosses are being, you know, when this comes to their bonuses, what is it going to do? Uh, you know, what, how are they, how, how are they, what is it based on? Is it based on stock prices? If, it's, if you're a publicly traded company, mm -hmm. is it depending on profitability of your department or whatever, or whatever area you're over or your plant that's over, all those type of things. Well, now you got to start talking to them, the C, the, the people, if, if you're at a plant, even if you're not at the C-suite, if you're talking to the plant manager, why you want to do this stuff. Well, because you know what, if we do this, it's going to, we're going to save, we're going to save X amount of money. It's going to make us more profitable and that's going to impact on your bonus. <laughs> well, now you have their interest. Now you yeah. might have some chance with buying. Yeah, that's why now, you know, now they're starting to talk about, it. now they're going to see like that. So you're going to, you're going to be doing that. And then you're going to start drawing in the other departments. And I don't know if you're familiar with ISO 45001. Came out a couple, couple of years ago. I was, I, I'm, I'm still on the committee. I'm on the 
the the ISO 451 Technical Advisory Group that wrote the standard. I've been doing this since 1913, not 1913. I'm not that old, but anyway, um, yes. Yeah, and so, so, and that's kind of where you know, one of the things that we tried on the uh, ISO 45001 was to try to really how we get safety. Part of the discussion was how do we get safety professionals into the C-suite. Mm-hmm. And then, and so that's why we talked about those things, and that's why it's a risk-based system. It's a risk because they understand risk, but you got to you got to be able to articulate the risk. But the standard also requires that you encompass all the groups. Right. Call, it's ta- uh, you know, you know it's, it talks about workers and other interested parties. Well, other interested parties uh, and workers covers everybody in the plant, even the CEO, CFO, plant manager, whatever it is, but. When you're doing your risk assessment, you're also including all the other departments. You're including, you know, the production, air, production, main, uh, production. You're including maintenance. You're including quality. All these things articulate. And now we're talking about. Now we're looking at the risk. What are the safety risks that we have here in our facility, and why are these important? Because, and then you'll be able to articulate. Well, if we don't address this safety risk, then we could have uh, this machine go down or this whole department to go down because of an accident or something, or an explosion or something. Maybe the whole plant shuts down because of an explosion. Uh, and now we have now we have other people supporting us, because that's one of the other things. We've not, we've not really cooperated or coordinated with other departments to explain why we should be doing this thing. So now if you say, we have this safety risk that's going to shut, if we don't address this, we might have an explosion, or, or, uh, and it's going to shut down the plant. And guess what? If it shuts down the plant, you get no production, you get uh, your productivity goes to zero, and your bonus is out the window. Ah, oh, now once again, they have an interest in this because they don't want the production to stop. Absolutely. They don't want quality to go down. They don't want, you know, and all this stuff. And so now you have, when you're going to the C suite, and talking about why we should be implementing this particular safety program or why we need to be getting this equipment or why should we be doing this uh, management change or, you know, whatever it is, uh, um, program and making sure that we don't have an explosion at the plant. Mm-hmm. Now we have standing beside us, we got production on one side, we got maintenance on the other, and we got quality on the other. Mm-hmm. Because they all see that not only is this important to the plant, but it could impact them, them personally. Absolutely. So now you've got people, you got a lot more support. And that's what ISO 45000 really was intended to try to do. Increase the support, get safety profession to the C-suite and basically help them to identify risk. Mm-hmm. So I think that's um that's one of the that's one of the main challenges that a safety professional has is the lack of or the mindset of, of the lack of support around me. They sometimes they often feel that they're the only ones driving the program or it's them and a select few, maybe the safety committee. And how do I find help to drive this program alongside me? And as you know, a safety, a safety committee cannot drive a safety culture. A safety mm-hmm. committee can only do so much, but you need buy-in from leadership from, and I right. love how you painted that picture um, from leadership, from production, from quality, from the maintenance team, you need everybody rowing towards the same goal um, to ultimately get there. And so I think that's wonderful. You said something um, actually in the beginning, the beginning of the podcast, I thought was really interesting. And I noted it down to circle back to it was, you also mentioned that going, you didn't say in quite these words, but going, doing the bare basics, doing the, the, the OSHA requirements isn't going to get you there and right. isn't going to reduce fatalities and and by shoving compliance down companies' throats, that's not going to work either. What's going to work is getting the employees, the team to want to be safe, you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And so I'm so interested to hear your perspective because you have a wonderful perspective, the attorney side of you, <laughs> the safety yeah. side of you, the yeah. business uh, side of you. How have you found is the is there a proven process what have you found to get is the best way to get a team to get a company rallied towards wanting a safety culture wanting a better safety culture 
Well, I, I think you got to, uh, and once again, I would go back to 45,001 because we talked about all these different things uh, that we wanted to try to get help the safety profession with. And that was one of them that you said, how do we get employee engagement? How do we get you know, real engagement? How do you get involved? In, and and that's how we wrote, we wrote the standard to, to, to foster all those type of things. That's why. And to think of things that you never think about, that was the other thing we always thought about if you, in the in the program. And they even talk about bullying in, in 45,001, which is really kind of interesting that you wouldn't expect that in a safety standard. Yeah, but then again, we had a case, what happened on that particular, well, that, the United States suggested adding that, was we had a case, um, when I, we had our meeting, we had a face-to-face -face meeting, and um, two weeks before that, I had been involved with uh, uh, a case where an uh, employee was being bullied by another co-worker, mm -hmm. and uh, he went out to his car in the parking lot, came back, gun, shot the guy. Mm -hmm. and that's why we, we saw that as a safety issue. Absolutely. But uh, I think getting the employee engagement is, is always, it's, it's not the easiest thing. And but it, once again, I find that if you include people, and, and this is the part of the problem, I think, of the safety profession over the years, it's been, um, it's been, well, that's the safety, that's the safety manager's job to write those yes. policies and have those procedures and do the safety thing. That's their problem. That's not my job. Yeah. And it's not my stuff there. And um and as a result, the safety profession, professional was the one, or the safety manager, director, whoever it was, was responsible for doing all these policies and everything. And he was, he or she was doing them by themselves, and not having the input from other people. And um, uh, it's it's been, um, uh, I think that's kind of one of the things there that we're seeing. You know, that was what we were focusing on too. Like I say. We want to make sure that everybody's involved. That's why it talks about workers and other interested parties. And the other interested party for 45,001 is, is, is the employees, but it's also, uh, you got the employees, but then you got contractors, subcontractors, you know, vendors, suppliers, the public, if they come around your thing. And then even went further than that. We're looking at what's, let's start looking outside the fence and see what things that we have inside the fence could happen, could impact people outside the fence. I.e., we we make you know we make very flammable liquids, and if they blow up, it's going to impact the town. Or the other way around, what is a is, you know is there is there a, tr a railroad car trains or railroad tracks to go by our plant, and we get all this uh, ammonia being shipped past our plant all the time. If we have a derailment, what's that going? How's that going to impact? Mm -hmm. But we really kind of so we're talking about all those different things. But the part of focus was we want to try to get everybody involved. And actually, do help being help being actually be part of the process. And I think that I find that if you include employees in the development of policies and procedures, yes, uh, that then they have a stake in those things, and then they take ownership of it. And that's clearly what you want them to do. If you want to, you want to get engagement. You got to get them to take ownership. But the only way to get to get ownership is they're involved in the initial process of because they're going to want to see what they put together fail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I so, couldn't agree more. I think that's Maybe. kind of where you really kind of, but then that was, like I say, that was, we talked about all those things when we were developing that standard. And uh, because we really wanted to drive safety, but we also wanted to help the, the safety professionals. Absolutely. Yes. And the inclusion piece is such a huge takeaway for our listeners. I couldn't agree more. Um, you talked with Bloomberg Law, Law in an article a few months back and about- Oh, no, not you, that one. <laughs> not that one. Not hey, that one. Get great no, no, I was out of the country that day. <laughs> that was not you. And just, uh, just the of the conversation of how nearly half of employers cited um, by OSHA with um, COVID related COVID related citations that they were appealing at a higher rate. And so, why do you think that is? And what do employers? What's some advice that you would give employers now? Um, With respect to COVID, mm -hmm. well, first of all, I, I, <laughs> well, I, I think most importantly, you if you should have, and it's a little bit too late, but not. I mean, but you can. It's not that you can't start now, but you should have had a COVID action plan put in place where you're doing all the different things and that you were documenting. See, the part of the problem was they uh, people weren't documenting stuff, and right. um, and what was I concerned about from a, a standpoint when this when the COVID broke out first broke out and OSHA started looking a little bit into that thing, I um, 
you know, I was getting calls from clients and saying, oh, well, you know, we got, we have these COVID cases, but thank God our workers comp said that this is not work related. These <laughs> cases are not work related. Who did and you I say? said, uh, <laughs> well, uh, you, you better make sure of that because um, if, if, if they're not covering it, if you're not giving, if they're not covering this, then you're not going to have the, the workers comp bar protection, mm -hmm. i.e. limited liability. And if it turns out that it is work related and you've not, and now, now you get sued in tort, negligence, tort lawsuits or whatever. And I still think you're going to see, I, I believe you're going to see a lot of cases coming out in the next two years because based most states, the, 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 the negligence liability statute of limitation is two or three years. So you're going to see a lot of companies getting sued by people who either either going to get sued for negligence and that you didn't protect them from um, con contracting COVID because you didn't do you didn't do the uh, health screening, you didn't do the mask the required mask, you didn't do the social medicine, you didn't do the sanitation, all those things. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't, if you've not documented that stuff that you were doing in the past year and a half and you get a case, you're going to be in true serious trouble because these negligence, you're talking about, you know, if it's not covered by uh, workers comp, which limits your liability. I mean, even on a, even on a death case, liability is only a couple, a couple hundred thousand, not, not a couple million. Yeah. So you need to be aware of that. But I'm telling you, if you've had people that have died and you claim they were, it wasn't work related, you, and uh, you better be looking over your shoulder to make sure that uh, you don't see some plaintiff lawyers coming to file a lawsuit, a negligent, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, yeah, wrongful death action in tort uh, against you. So, and if you can't prove, if you don't have the documentation, show all the things that you were doing during the COVID, you're, you're going to set yourself up for significant li legal liability, monetary penalties, much, much greater than OSHA. But OSHA has been, you know, and, and I think that's part of the reason why you saw more people contesting these cases because they were afraid that um, if they were determined to be work-related and they hadn't covered it, then, you know, they, they, they had a lot of other legal exposure beyond just OSHA. And... Um, and which they do. I'm, I'm very. I'm still concerned. I think in the next two years you're going to see a bunch of lawsuits being filed. They're already been filed, and it's all basic stuff. I mean, you look at them. The, the lawsuits are all the same. My employer did not did not enforce the man, mask mandate. Did not enforce social distancing. Wow. Nice. So those are the things you're going to have to be really be concerned about because, um, particularly if they, if you claim that these were not work related because you have no protection of it and they cut people come in there and on a wrongful death action, mm -hmm. you know, I was sure would say, oh, that wasn't work related. Well, how do you know it wasn't work related? Did you, did you do any contact tracing right. or anything else like that? Did you, did anybody else in the plant have COVID before this person had it and died, mm -hmm. you know? And if the answer is yes, oh, now how close were they working to this person? Were they in the same department? Were they on the same line? Were they in the same area? Mm -hmm. Well, if you say yes, or, you know, or if the evidence shows that that was the case, then, you know, you got some issues here. That's great advice. And just while we're, for the audience, while we're filming this, we, the recent last couple, um, in the last couple weeks, the events have been that LA has recently shut down. And so there is conversation of, okay, is that, you know, will that come to Colorado? Is that, are we going to experience what we did last year? Are we, are we about to enter that realm again? And I think it's great advice that um, if you didn't last year have a COVID program and something, a program where you're documenting all the preventative steps that you're, that you were taking as an employer, then now's the time um, to either implement that or geez, for your own records, look back and see and start documenting what you did do um, as a company. So my last question for you, just so you know, I can't believe our time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you probably ran out of your number of questions. You've, you've exceeded your number of questions. I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, I can't, can't go past, but holy smokes. I have so many more questions. And what I want to wrap up with is one, I would love to do a part two with you and a part three. And I, I, this could be an ongoing conversation. I'd be so interested to get the feedback from this podcast and see what kind of question 
um, transpire. That was happening to me for everyone watching on video. My <laughs> my lights have gone in my office uh, twice now. So I apologize for that. But I just want to ask you, Ed, what are you passionate about? You have an extensive interesting background in safety and law and I could just talk to you all day about it but what what are you really passionate about right now is there a project that you're really excited about yeah yes yeah tell us about it yes my eight-year-old daughter oh my god <laughs> yes the drawing now we have to post you know, the drawing and it's just to show how old I am. I'm 68 and she's eight I love it people say I'm crazy but that's oh. one of it. Well, with respect to safety and health, um, one of the things I've been working with um, is the uh, Florida Chamber of Commerce. Okay. Uh, I'm on there. I think I'm the only non-Floridian on the Florida Chamber's Safety Council. But you have a good and, perspective. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. It's just kind of funny. But that's one of the areas I've been working. They had, they had their first conference last March. Okay. And uh, they were. it was at Disney. And they, they were limited to the number of, they, they were limited to 300. Disney said, you can only have 300 people, period, because of COVID. No, and no, that was fine. But this is the first conference. They maxed out at 300 and had over 200 people on a waiting list. Wow. But it was a really great, um, and, and I'm thinking, you know, what I'm really excited about the Florida Chamber is they have committed, uh, and this is how you talk about driving safety. They have they their commitment is they want to have Florida to be the safest workplace state in the country. Oh wow! And they're putting their money where their mouth is. Um, they're going to have a uh, they're having the next conference is going to be in uh, in May excuse me in March end of March March 30th, 31st and April first once again down to Disney. So that's always a big draw. That's not, that'll be, but um, but I'm pretty they're going to they're limited to a thousand people. I suspect, uh, you know, by before uh, come January, they'll already have a thousand people signed up. They ha they're just really focused. and so that's one part of what I'm trying to do is to help them drive safety in the state, which I think is a, just a visionary. It's a it really is a vision for safety. And just think of every state in the country all of a sudden said, "We're going to be the best." No, we're going to be the best. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, this is going to they're they're they um, you know they've already got some great speakers, but we're focused on really. Having we're not we're not talking about the biggest conference. We just want to have the best mm -hmm. and help and not do the basic stuff. There's, two, there's plenty of conferences you can go to do basic. You know, you can go find out about how to do lockout tag or, or do confined space. This one is kind of big, uh, help how safety professors can drive forward. How okay. can how we're, we're looking at the cutting edge things, and so I, that's part of that's one of the big things I've been working on the last year or so to help them really develop this because I think it's a great goal. How to be the safest state workplace workplace state in the country. That's just a, a really uh, a really great goal, and uh, so I'm doing that. And um, incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I think that's that's probably the biggest thing. I, you know, I, I um, we, you know, I just, you know, I, I just try. For me, my goal always is when I'm working with clients, is to help them have a better safety program after we finished up than when they started. Oh, I love that. And, you know, that's, I, I feel like I do, I, tr I very much try to do that. I, I focus on getting them out of the OSHA problems that they have, mm -hmm. but then saying, okay, we, you know, we, we've got, we, we, we kind of dodged the bullet or whatever, but let's, let's look and see how we can improve your safety program that you're going to have even a better safety program now. So that, you know, I always want to try to set it up that my clients never have to worry about OSHA showing up because they, if OSHA does, they're going to find they got a great program in place and everything. They meet all the requirements. And like you mentioned earlier, um, you know, if you're just meeting the OSHA requirements, you're just you have at best a fair safety program, not even a good safety program. Absolutely. Uh, because it is, it was always intended just to be the base because they could never do, couldn't do more than that. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I've encouraging the other thing. I when I talk, I do a lot of talking about ISO forty five thousand one because I think that program can really help companies go from good to great to world-class in safety. It's, it's a, a continuous improvement model because all ISO standards are that way, but they should, uh, it's a way to get really moving things forward. So. And final but, bonus question, because what you just said, sparked huh? something. What's this bonus question. 
<laughs> Where's my contract? Hold on, I gotta look at my contract. I don't remember a bonus con- bonus question of course, clause. In the of course, that you get him on the phone. Um, my last question is what? Where do you see the future of safety? Um, you mentioned that the conference there in Florida. I mean, they're talking about the future of safety. We're not. You, they're not doing the basics. They're not doing the lockout, tagout, fall protection, um, breakouts. They're talking about the future. And so um, do you think that the conversation is too early? Um, or do you think that the future is talking about mental health in the workplace and behavior? And um, is that too soon? Well, I mean, I think I, because of the pandemic, you're going to have a lot more mental health issues than we've ever had before in the workplace. I mean, it just is going to be, there's going to be all kinds of stuff. It's a, people are going to be upset because, you know, you're the you know, I was staying at home and I didn't have to drive anywhere. You know, now they want me to come into the office and I got to drive 45 minutes just to get one way to go to work. Um, and I didn't have to do that before. And, it, you know, I did my job great um, while we were on that. So I could just stay at home and they're saying, no, you're going to come in. I think you're going to have those type of issues. And that causes that's kind of makes people disgruntled, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, you know, in, inevitably, I mean, I think if you look at the statistic, it shows that you know, most employees are not engaged anyway, unfortunately. And Mm -hmm. that's why you have to, you have to make it, make it personal to them. So I think that's part of the thing that you, uh, you have to do. But, uh, and the other thing I would say where safety going, I I mentioned it before is risk. Okay. Um, You know, the, you know, 25 years ago, the insurance industry moved to a risk-based model. Maybe longer than that, I can't remember. But anyway, about that, it was not when I was practicing. I was had been practicing law for a little while, mm-hmm. and what was happening is they were they were they were insuring these companies, and these companies they had a safety director, they had they had safety manuals, you know, big old manuals, they you know, ten inches big, <laughs> yeah. all these policies. You know, we do all this training. We got videos. We got all this stuff, and um, and so they were you know rank rating them. And uh, based on all that, and and then they found out they were losing their butts. Mm-hmm. I was going to say ass, but I know you can't say that, so I have to say butts. You can but say anyway. what you could say it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, and they couldn't figure. They look, started looking at this. Said, "What's going on? Where where these What's people should thing? have great? Where, why are we getting these losses?" Mm-hmm. And that's when they went to the risk model. Or they looked at risk instead of just looking at you know lagging indicators. They went to risk. And that's the insurance industry across the board went to risk mm-hmm. 25 years ago. Unfortunately, the safety profession didn't pick that up. And um, it is now, it's moving more of that way. And that's, I think, where it has to go. We have to identify the risk in, in the workplace not, not and be proactive as opposed to reactive dealing after that. Somebody's had an accident. Oh, we sh- that's machine. You shouldn't have had that. We should have that machine guarded. And instead, now that guy lost his hand. Yes. Yeah. So more pro. Uh, and so, but if we do it by risk, we're going to say, "Oh, that needs to be guarded. Let's fix that right now mm-hmm. before somebody does get hurt." And that's that's like I say. I think that's where that's the biggest thing that's going on in safety. I think right now is that movement towards risk. I love it. I yeah, that is great food for thought for the listeners, for myself. I think that that's an interesting perspective, and I couldn't agree more. And I have gone way past our time. So, Ed, thank you. Yes, so I'll much. send the bill to you. <laughs> send it to Seth. <laughs> send it no, over. Matt, no, Seth oh. said, hey, I kept, I kept buzzing. I kept saying, waving my hands and you didn't see me telling you to stop. <laughs> Everyone will, watching on YouTube will see this. And gosh, you've been so insightful, Ed. You've provided so much information. The listeners got, I was trying to write down to um, way too many notes and I'm just going to have to re-listen to this podcast a few times myself. I learned a lot. So thank you for your time today. I know you're a busy man. So thank you. Thank you. I can't wait to continue the conversation and follow up on these things. But, um, so everyone, thank you for listening and, uh, a link to all of Ed's, um, direct his LinkedIn. That'll all be linked in um, into this podcast. So thank you again for listening and we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Ed. Thank you.